As survivors struggle to come to terms with the horror of Cyclone Nargis, the regime in Myanmar faces mounting pressure to open its borders to aid, but it has been slow to react. So just why is the military junta putting up hurdles to what is seemingly a purely humanitarian disaster? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome, I'm Jane Dutton. Well, with fears that up to 100,000 people in Myanmar's devastating cyclone have been killed, aid has been rushed to the region. The first UN flight delivering much needed goods finally arrived on Thursday. But most aid remains in Thailand as the UN and other agencies wait for approval from the Myanmar regime. Yet the government remains reluctant to accept help, fearing any outside interference. The United Nations said travel and visa obstacles are hampering deliveries of aid. A clearly angered international community is demanding access to the worst affected regions, urging Myanmar to put humanitarian needs ahead of politics. Now, this comes despite reports indicating that up to one million people have been left homeless, forced to deal with disease and starvation. This report from our correspondent who cannot be named for the sake of her security. A fishing village near the Irrawaddy Delta. Villagers here have buried 2,000 bodies in the past few days in every available dry patch of land, often two to three in the same grave. The survivors of Cyclone Nergis are hungry and homeless. This man had a house before. Now he and his family of five have nowhere to go. We've been reduced to eating broth. Everywhere we went, people looked helpless and desperate. Government food aid has arrived, but people say it's not enough to survive. This woman insisted that we follow her to her house. 18 of her relatives, brothers, sisters, nephews and nieces were swept away by the cyclone. The family is distraught, and her mother is beside herself with grief, but she wanted her story to be told. It became windy at 9 o'clock at night and at 11. Water flooded and people started running. They were clinging onto the trees. In the early morning, around 3 or 4, people started to drown. <laughs> she survived by holding on to a pole, her neck just out of the water. And despite their own tragedies, the villagers have come to console her. But everyone in the village have their own story to tell. The government gave four glasses of rice and a small fish to each family. It's just not enough. If we don't get any assistance, we'll die here. Already most people have started to get diarrhea. They have not had clean drinking water since Friday and there is little shelter from the rain. A million traumatized people in southern Myanmar are enduring conditions like this and time is running out. Al Jazeera in the Irrawaddy Delta, Myanmar. The reluctance by the Myanmar government to let aid workers in the country has triggered an outcry around the world. The US, which has, along with a number of Western countries, imposed tough sanctions against Myanmar of its human rights record, says the military rulers there should not politicize the aid. This is not a matter of politics. This is a matter of uh, a humanitarian crisis. And it should be a uh, matter that the government of Burma wants to see its people receive the help that is available to them. And so we are speaking with uh, governments that might have influence with, uh, with Burma. Um, we have spoken with uh, all of the uh, nations that you might expect, and uh, I will myself make some other calls because uh, uh, this is the kind of crisis that will only get worse without uh, humanitarian assistance uh, being made available from the international community. Her French counterpart Bernard Kushner went further, calling for tough action against the regime in Myanmar through the United Nations. He has suggested invoking UN's doctrine of collective responsibility, whereby the UN would intervene without waiting for the Myanmar government's approval. Krishna himself, a co-founder of an aid group, added this should be the basis for a resolution to force delivery of aid to its survivors. 
Well, in 2005, the United Nations recognized the concept of responsibility to protect civilians when their governments could or would not do it, even if this meant intervention that violated national sovereignty. Joining us to discuss this are our guests in New York, John Holmes. He's the UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. In Washington, Beauch Latin, spokesperson for the Burmese government in exile. And in London, Marie Lull. She's an associate fellow of the Asia program at Chatham House. Mr. Holmes, good news. One UN plane has been allowed to land. What impact will that make to your mission there? Well, I think, in fact, four planes have been allowed to land today from the World Food Programme, um, carrying about 40 tonnes or so, 40 metric tonnes or so of high-energy biscuits, and that's good news because that's food which is immediately consumable uh, even when you have no cooking facilities on the ground in the Delta as soon as that can be distributed. But I'm afraid the truth is that's also a very small amount compared to what's needed overall, both in terms of food and all sorts of other items. So it's a good sign, but uh, it's only the beginning of what we, we're going to need in the next few days. It must be very frustrating knowing that you have the planes waiting to take off, the aid that is there to be distributed. It has been suggested by Bernard Kushner that you could go in with or without invitation by the regime. Are you likely to do that? Well, it's, it's very hard to imagine how you would actually do that. You do need the cooperation of the government in these circumstances if you're going to deliver aid effectively. Um, our only concern is to make sure we do get that aid through to people on the ground in the Delta uh, who are who are suffering unimaginably at the moment um, from all that's happened, not least the number of corpses that are around that need to be dealt with. So uh, our, our only concern is not to get involved in any kind of politics or any kind of political discussions about the referendum or anything else, simply to work with the government as best we can to get that aid through. Now, is a path of confrontation with the government likely to help? Uh, my judgment, our judgment at the moment, is that it's not. Um, but this is a picture we're keeping under review and we're pushing as hard as we can and trying to make sure that we do make progress. The progress so far is, is disappointing. Um, that's a mild word, but that's um, the word I'll use for the moment, and frustrating. Um, but we have to go on pushing as hard as we possibly can, which is why the Secretary General is trying to talk to the Senior General of the, of the Myanmar government uh, as we speak. So, Ms. Lal, what do you make of this delay? Is this catastrophe being politically manipulated by both sides? I think it's, uh, th uh, there's been politicization right from the start, starting off with Laura Bush's statement. I think what we have to remember is that the full picture is not being given by the Western media. A lot of aid is actually coming through. It just happens to be aid coming from Asia. It's aid coming from India, from China, from Thailand. Um, so it's, I understand that more aid is needed and more UN aid is needed. But you also have to understand that the Burmese government is confronted with Western governments which have had a 20-year sanctions policy. And as a result of that, they're going to be suspicious of anyone who says, we want to bring aid in, but it comes with conditions and it comes with people, specifically when the United States started talking about Navy ships. Do you think these Western sanctions and the repressive policies of the regime have contributed to this disaster? Infrastructures not in place, people weren't necessarily prepared. Let's remember that this is not a cyclone-prone area. The um, country is poor and there is bad infrastructure, absolutely. But this is not a cyclone-prone area. The last cyclone, I understand, was in 1926. So it's not like um, certain parts of India or Bangladesh where you could point your finger and you say, well, you know, they knew that this is an area where they should have put infrastructure in place. But um, this came totally uh, unexpected. Now, a lot of the infrastructure in the Delta area were uh, boats and ships, i.e. there weren't many roads, these have all been washed away by the tidal wave, which means that in any case, even if there was a lot of goodwill by the government, it would be very difficult and very slow. OK, Mr. Schlatten, give us an idea of the mindset of these rulers. What's behind this delay? What are they so frightened of? Um, well, the, the military regime is not, uh, you know, putting the priority of the humanitarian emergency at this point. They are f forwarding their old plan of the so-called national referendum to, uh, to, to be able to finish according to the uh, timeline on the May 10. So that, that is, uh, you know, we have to say that military itself is not paying attention to the human tragedy in uh, the country. They are uh, accusing other or, you know, guessing, uh, fearing the other interference and to see that what is really going on under their corrupt military misrule. Mr. Holmes, if 
this aid doesn't reach the country soon. What are you predicting? What are you frightened of happening? Well, what we fear is what is already an enormous tragedy with, with tens of thousands of people killed and uh, up to one and a half million people severely affected, which is our latest estimate. That initial tragedy may be followed by uh, a second tragedy, which is it is possible to avert, of the outbreak of waterborne diseases and people beginning to, to suffer and maybe even die from the, the combined effects of, of lack of food, lack of clean water, disease, lack of shelter. Um, that's why we need to get the aid in so urgently. Now, it is true, of course, that even if we had free access, it would still be very difficult because of the nature of the terrain, uh, the, all the infrastructure being washed away. But that's why it's so important to get that cooperation uh, and that facilitation from the government without let or hindrance. And that's uh, not what we have at the moment. So with these waterborne diseases, uh, I believe that bodies are floating by survivors. Even if you get that aid to those victims in time, I mean, how much time do they have to survive in the conditions that they're in at the moment? Well, I think that's very hard to say, and I'm certainly not any kind of medical expert. Um, I think in, in similar disasters to this, for example, in Bangladesh last November, or if you think about the tsunami, uh, aid is not uh, always very quick to arrive, but once it arrives, it is able to avert you know, what may be a secondary tragedy. And we saw that in the Pakistan earthquake too, where there were, where there were great fears of, of, of secondary deaths from cold or disease, and we were able to avert those. That's what we need to do here. We still have some days before this becomes really, really serious um, or, or, or unstoppable, uh, but that's why we need to move very fast now. Mr. Shalatan, what stories are you hearing from your people there? I mean, I know that many of them are angry with the slow pace of the aid getting to them, but what are they telling you? Absolutely. They are, you know, very frustrating that, that nobody is coming and distributing. At this point, they hear that international aid is arrived, but uh, some area they're receiving is very uh, not enough food or uh, other thing. So people, majority of people are you know, hopeless and they feel very angry and they are frustrated. Mr. Holmes, we are getting reports that some of this aid has been siphoned off by the regime and the money that is aimed for the survivors is not actually getting to them. Can you confirm that? Um, I can't confirm that. I mean, clearly there are going to be concerns about that and worries about that as there have been from the beginning, which is why the aid agencies, the UN agencies and the NGOs uh, are very insistent that they should be able to keep track and control of the supplies they're bringing in and be able to monitor what's happened to it rather than simply handing it over either cash, which you wouldn't do anyway, or, or supplies to the government for their onward distribution. Now, that's been a, a somewhat difficult discussion, but I think we have made some progress on that. So I think the World Food Programme Food, for example, which has uh, been arriving today, will re remain under the control of the World Food Programme for onward distribution. OK, let's take a short break now, but when we come back, could a concerted international effort push the Myanmar regime to soften its stance on aid and ultimately lead to political change? Stay with us.